the emotion of the cup, bless you, or a frill, or, you know, if you don't sense that, I mean, you can only decline so much, and then you're declining what? We need the parfum. We need the essence, the undiluted creativity, which is artisanal. Only then, I feel, can we exploit that into the ready to wear, or the eau de toilette, or the eau de parfum, and so on and so on, right down through to the accessories. Success needs coherence of a brand. John Galliano is one of the most celebrated and equally notorious fashion designers of our time. He catapulted onto the French fashion scene with the help of some of the biggest names in the business, who saw in him a unique talent. His creativity is unparalleled, drawing on his rich heritage and love of culture. He is a character unto himself. As much as the models open the theatre of his runway, Galliano himself draws the final curtain. His own physicality and costumes often rivaled that of his couture gowns. Galliano injected fun into the stuffy world of high fashion, exploring opulence as a form of entertainment. His shows were completely immersive and rich with story. Galliano redefined the possibility of a fashion show, moving it beyond the sales room, beyond the industry to a level of public spectacle that would attract the attention of the world. After moving to Paris, Galliano became the first British designer to lead a French couture house, with his appointment at the House of Givenchy. But it was not long before he was promoted to the head of Christian Dior. Not only was he an outsider, but at just 36 years of age, he was considerably young for a role of such magnitude. It was his youthful and energetic spirit which would redefine the world of fashion and French haute couture, with a legacy that would outlast his final and dramatic dismissal from the house. This is a story of Galliano the Renegade, whose penchant for rebellion would make him one of the world's top creative geniuses and the bad boy of fashion. Born in 1960 in the British territory of Gibraltar to his native father and Spanish mother, a plumber and a flamenco teacher respectively, John Galliano moved to the south of England when he was just six years old. His parents moved in hoped for improved financial employment opportunities and Galliano explains how he was timid and insecure growing up in a strict Roman Catholic family. Finding it difficult as a foreign child being brought up in an English environment, Galliano often felt different and left out of his neighbourhood. He recalls how his mother would insist on dressing him in extravagant attire for running errands and everyday occasions, and as a result, he often felt bullied and estranged at the London Boys Grammar School that he attended. After finishing high school, Galliano went on to study at St Martin's School of Art, from which he graduated in 1988 with a first-class honours degree. Known for his whimsical and outrageous designs, his first collection, titled Les Incroyables, was extremely well-received by critics and was sold in Brown's The London Fashion Boutique. Galliano then moved on to launch his own fashion label with stylist Amanda Harlick and milliner Stephen Jones. The designer was, however, not very gifted with finances, which led to the termination of multiple backers and his eventual bankruptcy in 1990. Rumours flew that this young genius of British fashion had last-minute money problems and was being bailed out by friends, including the models themselves. I don't want to say don't want anything to say. about that. Could be, could be not. 
I don't know. Not know. No, I didn't ask. But it was no. I was going to do it. Whether he was, I don't. You know, I would have done it anyway. But I don't really know how much I got paid. I didn't ask. It was then that Galliano decided to move to Paris to make his skills more prominent to the international fashion industry, improve his client base, and gain the financial backing he knew he could achieve. Galliano soon caught the attention of Moroccan designer Faikal Amour, who based himself in Paris as the owner and creative director of fashion label Plain Sud. Sharing headquarters with this label, Galliano was able to establish himself as a foreigner designer in France and held his first show in Paris in 1989 during Paris Fashion Week. Galliano struggled financially for years, still producing work intermittently until he met and gained the support of American Vogue editor-in-chief Anna Wintour and Vogue's creative director for the American edition, Andre Leon Talley. This is a fragile poet, an endangered species in the fashion world. They are women who want to have the pieces. They want to include them in their lives. They identify, relate to his fantasy. These influential connections introduced him to the Portuguese fashion advocate and socialite, Sao Schlumberger, who financially and publicly helped Galliano regain prominence in the fashion world and even loaned him her house for a fashion show, arranging for several top models to work for free. Galliano also attained financial backers of the venture firm Arbola Inc. This step into the high society fashion circle is considered as a key component in Galliano's career and very important to his success as a designer. A rapid change soon swept across Paris fashion houses when Bernard Arnault, chairman and CEO of LVMH, decided to revamp a large cluster of his luxury holdings among those being Givenchy and Dior. Where Hubert de Givenchy was set to retire and Gianfranco Ferré, designer at Dior since 1989, needed a new change. In 1995, Galliano was appointed the designer of Givenchy by Bernard Arnault and thus became the first head British designer of a major French couture house. And John Galliano was absolutely the right man to replace Hubert when he retired because John has a very historic romantic sense that allowed him to re-examine the archives and rejuvenate the house but still stay within the Givenchy idiom. This is an original that Jackie Kennedy wore. Uh, he was soon to be replaced by Alexander McQueen and moved on to Christian Dior a year later where he received critical acclaim for his haute couture and ready-to-wear collections. This era caused quite a stir in the high citadel of Paris fashion, as it marked an end to the traditional culture of post-war couture and the beginning of the rock star designer craze, where brands started competing for celebrity style publicity. The shift away from traditional Parisian couture towards the creative forces of the trendy London scene was quite shocking for the many still stuck in the French ancient regime mindset. After all, it was a little shocking that notably acclaimed houses were turning to such young designers with little to no experience in couture to lead the future of international fashion. Arnaud's choices were however soundly calculated. Galliano and McQueen were storytelling designers, narrative spinners, imaginative and romantic geniuses, gifted with the ability to transform runways into innovative theatrical shows. The theatricality that you see is integral to simply his way of showing fashion. 
You know, he does not want to go and show fashion on a podium with just, you know, plain beige walls and his name put in the back so that the photographers will see when they have to have their film developed that it's John Galeon's runway show. He is about uh, drama. He's about theatricality. Galliano debuted his first show in line with the house's 50th anniversary. Galliano used the occasion to reflect on the house's history and the future he would bring to it, opening with classic tailoring that reflected the house's signature coats. There followed a gentle transition into modernity, with short skirts and leopard negligees disrupting the classicism, before falling headlong into cultural African headdress and beading with bright, colourful and exotic pieces, adding a surprising direction for the house. It's the greatest house in the world. I mean, I think every fashion student dreams of being a little part of it, but to be given the reins of the house is just something that I would never have believed would happen. Um, how could I say no? Christian Dior's Geisha was the creative concept behind Galliano's first ready-to-wear collection for autumn winter in 1997. Automatic doors etched with the house's logo opened on a new era of design for the esteemed French house. Highly energetic, youthful in spirit, Galliano injected his love of culture alongside hallmark tweed suits that were excited by a shorter than short skirt. Top models like Linda Evangelista and Carla Bruni brought to life Galliano's exotic vision of American screen siren Jane Mansfield taking a trip through the Orient. This is haute couture history in the making. And anyone who sat in the Grand Hotel and watched John's debut collection for Christian Dior would agree. We saw something magical. It absolutely moved and transformed and inspired and this is what great moments in Oak are about. For spring 1998, Galliano raised the spectacle of his shows to new heights, using the backdrop of Paris's opera Garnier, based on his Italian muse heiress, Marchesa Cassati. A mysterious and eccentric patron of the arts, Galliano transported a 20th century salon to modern day Paris. An extremely feminine collection with its subtle colour palette, velvet gowns, lace sheaths and silk blouses and string pearls that choked the neck. Its opulence was more understated for Galliano, giving way to classic tailoring and his bias-cut backless gowns. Beyond creative and imaginative and it was a dream and it was energy and it was... Beyond fashion too. Oh well that, that's the best part of it. And I think this is what we need to see now. It's the kind of excitement, a kind of excess of beauty, but also a context. Fashion always needs a context. It's the palace. We were all invited to the palace today for a grand ball. But it was not always about looking back for inspiration for Galliano. On the precipice of the 21st century, the world was looking to its creatives to present them with a strong vision for the future. Galliano did not disappoint, welcoming the noughties in Versailles with an orcature collection with revolutionary undertones, matrix leather coats in red and black, futuristic mini dresses in metallic purple, even a red open parachute billowing behind a new innovation parachute dress for Galliano's closing number. By the spring of 2003, Galliano was in full swing. Vogue's Sarah Maurer argued the method to John Galliano's Dior madness is no longer in debate, saying that the designer has rebranded the legendary Parisian house via high-octane couture shows that broach the wilder shores of creativity and are then filtered down into instantly recognisable ready-to-wear pieces for Christian Dior addicts. His signatures were forming from his oversized leather jackets to his parachute dresses cinched at the hip, barely there bikinis, slinky pants and voluminous tops, showing off his craft by cutting fabric on the bias to make the most of its movement. Glamour was the overriding feeling. 
Galliano teamed up with his long-term collaborator and incidentally one of the world's leading makeup artists, Pat McGrath, to create the opulent characters that became synonymous with Galliano's time at Dior. Drawing on historical references, Pat and Galliano's creatures exploded onto the runway with overblown eyelashes, exaggerated eyebrows and high-gloss lips. There was an overt sexiness to Galliano's work, which came from his choice in materials, the cut of his cloth and his own personal technique known as décortique. The term itself, which in French means to shell a lobster, is in Galliano's world a metaphor for the undone, the unfinished. Peeled back layers, snippets of skin which alluded to the female form beneath and the process of his craft. For the fall of 2003, under his own line, John Galliano evoked the spirit and power of actress Joan Crawford in his autumn winter couture collection. The sartorial eyebrows and the 1930s glamour were interpreted in voluminous asymmetric sleeves, luxurious fur and vintage hats. Draped and tailored winter coats in bold, opaque colours gave way to a lighter boudoir of underwear as outerwear, layering shears and silks that revealed waist-high pinstripes and garter belts. Galliano moments like these are so immersive in the historic that Galliano himself would dress to character as part of his process. The theatre of his shows, from the attitude of the models to the drama of the makeup and the beat of the soundtrack, form the notes of modernity that pull together Galliano's vision into the new era. His label allowed for pure expression and depth into Galliano's storytelling. Meanwhile, his shows at Dior, whilst equally dramatic, delivered a more current offering. For Dior's fall 2003 ready-to-wear collection, skin-tight latex was contrasted against harlequin flounces. Whilst his couture offering drew on Galliano's Spanish heritage, fusing the house's French corsetry atop of flamenco ball gowns and featuring tango fringe silky numbers, Galliano capped off the show, taking his bow with the stance of a bullfighter staring down his critics. Galliano had a clear vision, and that did not include stepping in line with the current climate. According to the fashion press, haute couture is nearing the end of a losing battle. Versace and Ungaro have folded under the pressure this season, and the others are surely close behind. According to John Galliano at Dior, this is a perfect season to pile on the extravagance, with a collection fit for a royal court. What I walk away is the incredible vision of the one man called Galliano, and which makes us uh, look all and feel fantastic. It's going to get scaled down, you know, a little bit without, you know, trains and stuff, to, ready, uh, to hot couture, and eventually going to sit in six months in, uh, on me. Galliano knew instinctively that haute couture was at the heart of the Dior brand. It is the creative vision which enchants the public and forms the draw cord for its ready-to-wear lines. So at a time of economic plight, Galliano forged through with even more extravagance in his 2004 fall-winter runway with a collection fit for a queen, albeit a provocative one. Continuing the fashion entertainment, Dior's 2005 fall couture show delighted onlookers with a moody carriage ride into the Edwardian era. The show marked what would have been the 100th birthday of the founding designer Christian Dior. This collection became the turning point where the origins of Dior archives and its new captain really began to merge. Where Galliano made his claim was to bring a sense of lightness and subtle provocations with his sheer panels that lifted the age silhouettes into a new era, even transforming the house's signature tweed suits by remaking them in sheer organza. For Vogue's Sarah Moa, it was a timely reminder of Galliano's capacity for the delicate and poetic, as well as the reaffirmation of the incredible foundations of the House of Dior. By 2007, two anniversaries were afoot. Galliano was approaching 10 years at the helm, and the House of Christian Dior was to celebrate its 60th anniversary. The Fall or Couture Show was a masterful celebration of the two, with all of the joy of a live gospel choir that provided the show's soundtrack. 
Galliano's flair had evolved in perfect balance with 1950s creations of the house's foundations. Polished ball gowns, hand-painted silks, innovative silhouettes and opulence were the perfect notes to mark the occasion. Galliano had achieved the pinnacle of French fashion and the foreigner took the occasion to remind us of his origins, taking a bow garbed in the traditional outfit of a picador. In that same year, Galliano's spring-summer collection was one of the most memorable runways of his time with Dior. Inspired by Puccini's opera Madame Butterfly, of a tragic romance between two cultures, Galliano captured the beauty of Japanese heritage and infused it with the golden age of couture. Cherry blossoms amidst French architecture, reminiscent of Dior's salons, formed the backdrop to the collection, which gave reference to the traditional geisha, kimonos, samurai, and origami, with fabric folded to mimic the traditional paper art form. More than innovative, it was otherworldly. Galliano was creating fashion history, adding to the annals of Dior's rich archives with his unique creative vision. For fall 2008, Galliano brought back a sense of 60s optimism and opulence, inspired by the sirens of that era and American Vogue. Galliano stepped back through the archives of Dior's own contribution to fashion at that time for inspiration. So the hair at Dior is inspired by Raquel Welsh, Baby Jane Holzer, kind of sexy women of the 60s that had really, really big, glamorous hair. It's all about size, lots of lashings of lashes, liquid liner, huge exaggeration, very architectural. It was nice to work on the more boxy shapes that still kind of hovered around a woman's body, which is much more flattering. There was a great sense of humour to it, which I always love, about his work. He's always taking the past and being able to make it very... Uh, modern and sort of what everybody wants to wear today. That's his genius. My job is to make people dream, to make women dream, and everything looks better in the morning. The dream continued with Galliano's critically acclaimed spring-summer 2010 Haute Couture collection. Inspired by English-American designer Charles James, whose archives are held in the Costume Institute, Galliano's equestrian theme ran through its sculptured tailoring, extravagant ball gowns, top hats and veils. Pat McGrath was on hand to present that porcelain complexion and red lips on top models like Carly Kloss, whilst Dior fans enjoyed the regal opulence of the best in show. For Galliano, who had begun life as an illustrator, a collection dedicated to one of the greatest fashion illustrators of all time, René Grouel, would in high insight be a fitting subject for Galliano's last couture show at Dior, was for critics one of Galliano's finest moments. It drew on the new look of Dior from the golden age of haute couture of the 40s and 50s, reinventing the flared skirts cinched at the waist, pencil-thin gowns and the voluminous swing coats. Galliano brought to life the illustrative qualities of Grau's masterpieces, incorporating into the fabrics and embroidery the effects of pen, pencil and washes which were sketched across the artist's pages. According to Vogue's Tim Blanks, the collection was one of the most technically challenging with Dior artisans, using seven layers of tool to create a shimmering depth of degrade, to create the effect of light and shade. It was hallmark Dior, with a creative injection that only Galliano himself could draw to it. For his long-standing achievements and contribution to fashion, Galliano was named British Designer of the Year in 1987, 1994 and 1997, and he was made a Chevalier in the French Legion of Honour in 2010, France's highest award. He went on and proved to be so much more than his showmanship at Dior. 
Even though he knew little French, he had the know-how and expertise of visioning and communicating with the seamstresses, cutters and embroiderers. It was never his professionalism at work that brought his relationship with the company to an end. As spectacular as was Galliano's rise to the pinnacle of designer fashion at the House of Dior, so was his downfall and banishment. In one evening, his world would come crashing down. John Galliano is here. He was one of the most acclaimed fashion designers in the world. For many years, he was a creative force behind Christine Dior and his own label, John Galliano. Then, at a small Parisian bar near his home, he, on more than one occasion, said the most outrageous things. They were racist, anti-Semitic, and hateful. One of those incidents from 2010 was filmed. The video went viral. Here is that video. Well, I love Hitler. People like you would be dead today. Your mother's, your papa's, we c*** gas. Oh, oh my God. Do you have a problem? With you? Yeah, I know. When that video was released, John Galliano became the subject of international scorn. He was fired. He was convicted. He has apologized and he has entered rehabilitation. This conversation not about rehabilitation or about prosecution. It is about understanding why. It is about accountability and responsibility. It is about great creativity and troubling addiction. And it is about John Galliano who came from Gibraltar to London to Paris to New York and he took over the world of fashion only to fall at his own hand. On the 25th of February 2011, Dior suspended John Galliano because of his arrest over an alleged anti-Jewish tirade in a Paris bar. The anti-Semitic speech happened just before Paris Fashion Week, autumn winter 2012. In France, expressing anti-Semitic ideas is illegal. On the 8th of September 2011, Galliano was found guilty of making anti-Semitic remarks and sentenced to pay a total of 6,000 euros in suspended fines after a French court found him guilty of voicing public insults on account of race. Through this time, Galliano's company, Cheyenne Freedom, was also demanded to pay 1.17 million euros to Dior for damaging the company's image and reputation. Even the French government reacted to the affair, stripping Galliano of the Legion of Honor award he had so deservedly earned not one year before. Both Dior and Galliano's eponymous line, which fell under the same banner, also went into immediate overdrive in an attempt to keep the momentum of both houses going whilst minimizing any damage. Galliano was dismissed from the head of his own line and his tenure at Dior, with Raph Simmons finally taking over for the French house and Bill Gay 10 picking up the reins at John Galliano. For the latter, the intent was to keep producing under the Galliano name, with director Pierre Denis stating, obviously it has been a complicated year, but people are keen to support the house and we are producing great collections. I hope this will be reflected in the sales. As for Galliano, he argued no recollection of the incident that led to his ruin, acknowledging that his addiction had caused him to black out and act out of character. Plagued by the death of his father and friend Stephen Robinson, a colleague and Galliano's right-hand man who had been there since the beginning of his career, Galliano's composure began to crack under his addiction, which increased with the intensity of his surmounting pressure to produce. After each collection, after each creative high, there'd be this crash, and then there were all these... I used the drink to stop the voices. There were so many voices. Already in real life, there were so many questions. Um, I would use the alcohol to quieten um, the voices, but of course with the increase of the collection, that cycle became faster and faster and faster, where there was like a collection every four weeks. Along with all the successes came more collections. Um, more demands. At that moment, I was producing 32 collections a year between the House of Galliano and the House of Dior. Um, and each collection would comprise of up to a thousand pieces. Uh, by then I was a slave to alcohol, then I would take the Valium to stop the shaking so I could do the fittings, and then the sleeping pills so that I could sleep. Um, I was traveling a lot with the jet lag, and so, I mean, it 
my life became unmanageable. At that point in my career, I had become um, what is known as a blackout drinker. It's where um, one can't transfer short-term memory into long-term memory. So I have no memory of that event. And when you see that video, I'm in the throes of my disease. And how will you define your disease? It's a cunning, baffling disease. It it's, it's creeps up on you um, and, and you become a slave to it, a complete slave to it. Galliano took some time off during 2012 to deal with the court orderings from his public mishap and to concentrate on reconstructing his damaged career in the public eye. In early 2013, Anna Wintour helped Galliano attain temporary residency at Oscar de la Renta's design studio to help prepare for a showing for Oscar's fall 2013 ready-to-wear collection at New York Fashion Week. Galliano stayed clear of the limelight remaining backstage despite the collection's positive reception. Some reports even indicated a potential succession to the house of de la Renta, but these rumours never came to fruition. Many in the industry had stood by Galliano during this downturn, hoping to see him return. Jean-Paul Gaultier discussed publicly that Galliano had some unfinished business, arguing that the incident was incongruous to the inclusive nature of his creations. Model and friend Kate Moss, who has credited Galliano for teaching her how to walk on the runway, also convinced Galliano to produce again, engaging him to design her wedding gown in 2013. On the 12th of June 2013, John Galliano's first filmed interview since his dismissal from Christian Dior was broadcast on United States television. Chat show host Charlie Rose interrogated the designer, observing the unnatural pressures of the industry and its impact on designers like the late Alexander McQueen, who took his own life in 2010. When Alexander McQueen, who sat at this table with me, committed suicide, what did you think? Um, many things, Charlie. Um, I mean, I knew Alexander. I knew Lee. Um, Understood. But you think the lifestyle of, that he and both of you had contributed? He also had some medical issues that we all are aware of uh, well, that I had nothing to you, do with alcohol or drugs. I don't know what you mean by lifestyle. I mean, well, my, the style I of getting up in the morning and, and knowing you got to top that, and the style that, that you were in the center of public attention, and you know everybody's eyes are on you, and you know that, that every day you're going to be judged not by the past collection, but by the next collection. Yeah, you're you only know, as good as the last Only as collection. good as your last collection. Despite recognizing the fickle nature of the industry, Galliano remained earnestly optimistic. In closing, he stated, I am able to create. I am ready to create. I hope through my atonement I'll be given a second chance. True to his sentiments, John Galliano started to give back to the fashion industry, appearing as a student advisor at his former London college, Central St. Martins, and even signing on to present a three-day masterclass with New York's Parsons School for Design. However, the designer's most speculated return to fashion was marked by the announcement by the OTB group stating that John Galliano would take the position of creative director for Maison Margiela. Margiela had stepped down from his eponymous label in 2009 when it was acquired by Only the Brave, the same company behind Marnie, Victor and Rolf and Diesel. The Belgian designer's own legacy was to see the house run as a collective, with artisans and designers to dress in white lab coats as a form of equilateral uniformity. Designers Marius Schwab and Mathieu Blasey were both contenders to lead the team, but neither were officially appointed. According to Vogue's Lauren Milligan, despite Margiela's own policy, he was keen to see a leader at the label. And in 2014, Margiela was said to have approved of Galliano as the official successor. Shortly after the announcement, Galliano attended the annual British Fashion Awards to present the outstanding achievement honour to his most fervent supporter, Anna Wintour. In staunch loyalty, 
Wintour collected the award in a creation from Galliano's first collection at Maison Martin Margiela. The public appearances continued, with Galliano agreeing to a rare interview at the annual Vogue Festival. Galliano sat down with the then editor of British Vogue, Alexandra Schulman, to discuss the design philosophy and the new appointment at the house. In continuing to show his reform and restore his image, Galliano also spoke at a central London synagogue to address the anti-Semitic remarks that marred his persona, expressing a new outlook and attitude towards public responsibility. Once on board at Margiela, Galliano restructured the collective to form a mix of current and new team members, pulling his right hands from Dior to make up his dream team. In 2015, Galliano debuted his first show for the house, marking his triumphant return to the fashion fold. In former years, Galliano would have ended the show in a garb as dramatic as one of his designs, with the press and inner circle invited to explore the theatre backstage. One year, Galliano even famously transformed the back of house into something resembling the treasures of King Tut's tomb. But at Margiela, we saw a new, subdued Galliano. In the spirit of his predecessor, Galliano was ever humble, stepping out momentarily to his applause, dressed in the same technician coat as worn by his team. Backstage access was exceptionally off-limits to the press, with the designer delivering his statement via a press release. This lack of communication continued through the following seasons, with the now reclusive designer evading direct interviews in and around his shows. To combat the limitations of the written word, Maison Margiela have produced an exclusive podcast entitled The Memory Of, with John Galliano. The designer's musings explore the context, inspiration, and global climate that offer context around the agenda and inspiration of his collections for the House of Margiela. Maison Margiela's Spring 2016 Ready to Wear collection, entitled Lo-Fi Sci-Fi, was according to Vogue's Sarah Moa, Galliano's most rounded and product-filled Maison Margiela collection so far stating that Galliano is back on his game again, a relief for those who supported him in the first place, and a thrill for another generation who've grown up to see him through new eyes. Reminiscent of Galliano's 60s-inspired Fall 2008 collection for Dior, models donned a beehive updo, but with a futuristic twist, exploring the 60s optimism of space exploration. According to Moa, the notes were classic Galliano more than Margiela. As Galliano dug into his arsenal of exotic and oriental inspiration, as well as the bias cut slip dresses we have seen crop up time and time again across his career. Maison Margiela's spring artisanal show for 2017 did, however, mark a turning point for Galliano's own process. Stating that he is not talking about narratives anymore, since his rebirth, Galliano is less interested in creating theatre around his work, opting in with the Margiela aesthetic to let the work speak for itself, in order to evoke an emotional response. In a press release, Galliano hinted that the collection had overtures of American pioneers, which could be referenced according to Moa in the tall hats, folksy skirts, and native wool embroideries. Since being at the house, Galliano has continued to explore his technique of the décortique, implementing clever cutouts that reinvent tailoring, playing with shears, layering to create depth, and reconstructing through added texture with his standout embroideries and tool work. One highlight from this collection was a female portrait made from gathered tool. This art of deconstruction and reconstruction in part goes to the heart of the Margiela Codes of Aesthetic. So Galliano's established experiments in this area made him a natural fit for the house. But he is not totally transformed beyond recognition, ending the couture show with a Galliano signature parachute dress. For Vogue's Susie Menkes, Galliano's Autumn Winter 18 artisanal collection was John Galliano at his most profound and boundary pushing. Exploring the modern world's digital dependence, with models accessorized with a smartphone clamped to their leg, the abstract designs went from voluminous to restrictive. 
using signature shears overlaying for depth with layers of colour and implementing his cutout technique in oversized jackets that gave way to forms hidden beneath. What those forms were remained unclear. Female forms were exaggerated or hidden, paving the way for Galliano's androgynous agenda. For spring-summer 19, Galliano tapped into the current resurgence of punk rebellion, invading the fashion zeitgeist, which reflected on the current global discontent. His prairie punk collection, according to Nina Roth at The National, was a newer sartorial version of punk's ability to express the visual language of people's grievances. In line with this, Galliano has unveiled his first perfume for the House of Margiela, Mutiny, as it's called, was accompanied by a manifesto which praised the spirit and freedom of new youth, along with a co-ed show where gender barriers were broken down. With Galliano's groundbreaking refusal to continue to segment fashion into a marketplace of just male and female. According to Vogue's Anders Christian Madsen, Galliano has quietly and steadily been developing a new language for the house, drawing on its codes of anonymity and enigmas. Madsen refers to the one example in particular where Galliano debuted a new technique in which he effectively cuts the motif of a jacket into a skirt, then styled it as a cape and put it on a boy who looked like a girl. Gender neutral identities being a topic of interest at the moment makes it all the more important for Galliano to weigh in on the debate as someone who has for a long time championed the right to individuality and acceptance, a lesson in which he himself has lived through and come out of the other side purely evolved. Galliano has taken to spending time with the dedicated interns at Margiela and working with the youth ambassadors for the Mutiny perfume to become acquainted with the current mindset of youth today. It is acting as the source of his current inspiration and his conclusion that clothing underpins our every memory, our truth. In his own words, Galliano states, when they come to a house, they want to know what the house stands for, rightly so before they ever buy into it. For Galliano's truth, creativity is his mutiny. Ever the renegade, Galliano will continue to inspire designers for generations to come, with his creative endeavors that continue to push the political and social boundaries.